Welcome everyone to Scheller Lunchtime Live, a live stream series hosted by the Georgia Tech Scheller College of Business. My name is Lindsay Kane, and I'm the Associate Director of Client Relationships for non-degree executive education programs. On select Fridays at 12 p.m. Eastern, you'll have the chance to hear from Scheller faculty, student, and alumni speakers as they discuss relevant topics for the tech-driven digital age. At Scheller, we're proud to offer undergraduate, MBA, and PhD programs along with open enrollment and custom executive education programs. It's my pleasure to introduce Aaron Hackett, lecturer in marketing at Scheller. He teaches the brand management courses, receiving the student recognition of excellence in teaching, CIOS honor roll the last two semesters. Aaron, Aaron began his marketing career at Procter & Gamble, working in multiple business units and on many brands. His experiences working at PNG and teaching at Scheller inspired him to write 8020 Brand, Brand Building with a PNG Edge. Product Placebo, today's topic, is a chapter from his book that Aaron describes as powerful yet overlooked. Today, Aaron will look at how consumer perception of a product, regardless of its competitive advantage, can be distorted by factors that have nothing to do with the product's effectiveness. He'll discuss how the placebo effect can improve the consumer experience and how to resolve the perception issue using common marketing cues we all value. As always, feel free to ask questions in the comments section. Aaron will address as many questions as possible throughout his presentation. Over to you, Aaron. Thank you, Lindsay. I appreciate having the opportunity to talk to everybody today. Before I get started, let me provide a little context this topic, product placebo, it's not something that you're taught in business school, and it's not something they trained us on at Procter & Gamble. It was just a series of marketing stories that seemed to be unrelated. But before I get further, let me attempt to put you in a shopper mindset. Imagine you are in the grocery store and you remember that you need to buy mouthwash. You go to the oral care section and you choose between these two brands, right? Listerine and Crest Pro Health. To make your decision tougher, they're the same size and the same price. Which one do you choose? I ask this question every semester and I've asked my students for years. The answer is consistently Listerine, sometimes overwhelmingly, sometimes by a slight majority, but it, it's consistently Listerine. When I ask my students, you know, why they chose Listerine, I get a variety of answers. Sometimes they say it's because that's what their families always used. Sometimes my students say, well, you know, Listerine is focused in the mouthwash segment, so they're going to do a better job than anybody else. And then one or two comments later, someone pipes up and says, I choose Listerine because it burns, right? Because it burns. When you think about burn, it's, it's pain. And, when you, and, and in marketing and in brand management, pain is a negative attribute. So even though pain is a negative attribute, it tends to be the winning tiebreaker between these two brands. That's odd, isn't it? Where else is pain seen as positive? Can you think of any examples? What about working out, right? How do you know that you had a good workout, right? You know, when you can barely move and you are in pain, because as we've always said, no pain, no gain. So there is something intrinsic that connects things that are often viewed as negative as a cue for effectiveness. Let me take a, a quick detour. I'm going into the, the medical industry for a second to try to connect what's happening in the medical industry with what we see in marketing. And I want to talk about this thing we call placebo, right? Many of you know what a placebo is, but for those of you that don't, I'll describe it like this, is typically when you test a drug, you'll give a subset of patients the real drug, 
in a different subset of patients, what we call a sugar pill, something that they think is the drug, but not really the, the, the drug. And what we find over and over again, even though some subset of the patients take the sugar pill, they receive the benefits that the drug is supposed to deliver. This is an accepted phenomena. Now, even the FDA, when they approve drugs, they will allow a comparison versus placebo because our mind is that strong. Placebo, right? It's fascinating. My question is, how strong is a placebo, right? So I talked about how a placebo works, but what if you know about the placebo? What if you go to a doctor and you look for medicine and the doctor says, hey, I'm out, but you can try this sugar pill. They did a test and some people who took the sugar pill got relief. According to Harvard Medical School, a placebo works even when you know it's a placebo, right? right? So that's changing the way we think about a placebo. We thought it was all about the process, but a placebo is so powerful that it can, it can work even if you, you know you're getting it. All right, let me push this placebo theory a little bit harder. What about surgery? Can a placebo work in a surgery? And it, let me not go too far. I'm not talking about a heart transplant, but maybe a surgery that deals with pain. If you have, an, may say, a knee pain, and you were thinking about a knee replacement or some other surgery, would a placebo work? All right. Of course, it can't work. But that's not what the data shows. Right? They did a test several years ago. They tested 80, 180 patients. And, and, and just so you know, I know some of you are thinking, well, how do you do a placebo in the surgery? This is how the placebo portion went. It was a double blind, and double blind means the patient didn't know and the doctor didn't know either. When they brought the patient to the surgery room, the doctor opened the envelope, and in that envelope, they saw whether it was a placebo or not. And if it was a placebo, they simply cut open the skin, and then the team role played. They splashed water. They said a lot of the stuff they typically said during a surgery, and at the end of the time, they sewed the knee back up. What they found is the people who went through the placebo surgery had just as much of, of a benefit when it came to pain relief as the people who had the actual surgery. The people who went through the placebo, they, they were contacted years later. They were floored. They could not believe their surgery was a placebo. They, they had mentioned their lives had been changed. They can dance and they can do all these things. But what they had was only a, what we call a placebo, right? And that's what Listerine uses, a placebo, a burn, right? A burn is something that we subconsciously associate with effectiveness. Does Listerine have to burn to kill 99% of germs? Uh, the technology has advanced so far that that's not the case. If you look at Crest right next to it, Crest kills 99% of germs also without the burn. So for Listerine to get out of that, get the, the burn out of their product would be almost negligent on the brand's part because that placebo effect is an important element of delivering customer satisfaction. Right? So that's one story. Some of you probably have heard it. But stories with, that deal with similar placebos are more common than you might imagine. I mean, I've experienced them in my career. When I was at Procter & Gamble, I worked on this brand called Folgers, Folgers Coffee, major coffee brand. And just to give you some background, our what I call 80-20 target, the 20% of consumers that buy 80% of our, or that drive 80% of our revenue, they were what we called switchers, right? What that means is 
they went back and forth between us and Maxwell House, right? Our um, 80-20 target, we called her Carol. She would go to the store and she wanted a, a coffee brand that was reputable and wouldn't embarrass her when it came to company, right? So here's how she did her purchases. She'd go to the, the shelf, she'd look at Folgers, and she'd look at Maxwell House. And whichever brand was less expensive was the one that she chose. She was extremely price sensitive, right? Well, well, while I was working on Folgers, they were working on this thing we called Project Rudolph. Project Rudolph simply was a conversion from a metal can to a plastic can, right? Whenever we went on focus groups, there was always one person in the focus group who would say she had metal Folgers cans underneath her sink because they felt so heavy she didn't want to throw them away. So the thing about a plastic can, it worked into that consumer insight. If she's going to keep these, it makes it easier for her to, to use. You know, they're less, less likely to cut anybody with the metal edges. Our target or 80-20 target, you know, sometimes she was middle-aged, so sometimes she might have arthritis. When you had plastic cans, you can build in grips to make it easier to kill, the, I mean, to carry these um, heavier cans. So we launched a plastic can. And this is, and just, I, I'm saying it quickly, but the folks that, and my counterparts at Procter & Gamble knows this, this project was seven years in the making. You know, I happen to be one of the teams that was, you know, working through this. They went to a plastic can and we noticed an interesting dynamic. Now, when Carol went to the store, she saw our plastic Folgers can and she saw the metal Maxwell House can she can more consistently purchase Folgers, even if it was a little bit more expensive, right? There was something about that plastic can. And, I, and I, I'll talk about it in a second, but as a brand person, especially if you're on Maxwell House, what do you do? If you're losing a competitive advantage because your competitor went from metal to plastic, what do you do? This is what Maxwell House did. You know they. The obvious thing is follow, but they didn't go right into following. I was still in Cincinnati when they, when they levied their response, and I heard a commercial ad on the radio. And what they said is they had data that showed that metal cans kept your coffee fresher than the plastic cans, right? And I, I've never seen that data, but I tend to believe them. I think they were right. Do you think that message resonated? Do you think the data and the analytics got people, got Carol to say, you know what? The coffee's fresher based on the data. I think I'm going back to Maxwell House. It didn't sway anybody. So since the data didn't work, Maxwell House did the only thing they could. They followed. They also went into a plastic can. And just... Um, and just to complete the story, you may notice that Maxwell House is more cubic rather than cylindrical. The reason they did that is because with plastic cans, you have you know more ability to, to um, produce it in the shape that you'd like. That's how we did the handles on the sides of the Folgers. And by making their cans more cubic, they became more efficient with space when it came to operations. You can stack a lot more coffee together if they're in cubes rather than circles because you have those spaces. And students always ask me, well, you know, how come Folgers didn't do the same thing? Folgers was a billion dollar brand that was about to create a category changing, do a, create a category changing event. One reason it took seven years is we were petrified that we were going to mess up the business. We did not want to be the team that messed up the business. So even though we went plastic, that big change, we try to keep everything else the same. So what's the product placebo on this? The reason the metal cans didn't work is we grew up when, when we thought about freshness or saving food for the next day, we all use this thing called Tupperware. We put our leftovers in Tupperware and this plastic thing and when you open it, you hear the pop and you put it to, put it in and you feel like 
your, your food is fresh. You're keeping it fresh. Folgers played on that same thing. And I think this was an accident. It was unintentional. But Folgers played on the same thing. So these are just two stories. And, and to be honest with you, stories like this could keep you know, me and my fellow marketing faculty you know, engaged for hours. We'll, we'll, we'll be riveted on stories like this. But unfortunately, my MBA students aren't so easily impressed, right? They ask me, you know, these are nice stories, but how can you control the outcome, right? How can you engineer product placebos into what you do, right? And they're right. If you can't control the outcome and they're just luck and they're just stories, you know, you lose the impact. You should be able to strategically work these into what you do. All right. All right. I'm going to tell a quick story about how we implemented product placebos in a product, but I, I want to give you some context first. About 10 years ago, before I ever started teaching, I was the vice president of marketing and general manager for a private equity firm based in Alpharetta. In that role, I was over three business units. One of those business units was laundry. And in the laundry business unit, there were two products that captured my attention. And just uh, in an effort to pr pursue discretion, I'll just call them product A and product B for now, right? But I'll describe what they do, and then I'll tell you why they captured my attention. And, right, and I'll tell you up front, they're opposites in, in a weird way. Okay, product A, what is product A? Product A was a laundry product that helped remove odor and smell, right? From, from your clothes. So if, if you had kids that played soccer or hockey and had this strong smell, the product was engineered to help take the smell out of your clothes. So you would put your regular detergent in the washing machine, and then you put a cup of this product A, and the product was supposed to get rid of odor better than the detergent alone, right? That's product A. Product B was a product that allowed you to clean your dry clean only clothes at home in your dryer, right? So one, product A is an odor eliminator in your washing machine. Product B is a dry cleaning product for your dryer. And here's how they were opposite. Our R&D group, even though we're based in Alpharetta, our R&D group was based in Cincinnati and they were almost exclusively PNG veterans. So these guys were very specific. And this is what they told me. They said, you know what? Product A doesn't work. You know, we do the testing with the product and with detergent alone, and we have no evidence that it does anything to remove odors. And then when it came to product B, the product that you, where you dry cleaned your clothes at home, they said, in this product, we're able to measure the bacteria the clothes have before they go into the process and the bacteria afterwards, and it's an effective product, right? So that's, that's interesting, but this is what makes it even more interesting. The consumers had the completely opposite perception. So product A, the one that the R&D said didn't work, the consumer feedback was they loved it. They felt like it helped them get the odors out that they're trying to achieve, and they and and they were loyal, right? The product B, the one that R and D said worked. Consumers, they just were skeptical. They didn't believe it, and because they didn't believe it, they didn't repeat, right? So that product was having a hard time. If you are in this situation, where you have two products then display this dynamic and you're over a few business units. So you have to prioritize your efforts in your team, which product demands more of your time, right? Remember, this is not healthcare, this is laundry, right? It's disappointing that product A is not delivering the results. In this situation though, 
you'll just add, you, you'd ask product A, I mean, our R&D to work on product A, but since the consumers were happy, it's not as urgent. Product B is a stereotypical problem where a brand manager can make her money, right? Because the product actually works and consumers don't believe it works, right? So that was our focus. We had to fix this problem on product B where it actually worked, consumers didn't believe it worked. And that's where we work with product placebos. I'm not going to reveal product A because it didn't work, but that was over 10 years ago. So if you figure out what product A is, this is from a long time ago. You know, Don't hold it against product A, but product B, it worked. And that product is a product called Dryel. Dry L is, an, is a pretty old brand. Most of you have never heard of it. So let me describe what Dry L is. Dry L is a brand that was created and launched by Procter & Gamble in 1999. In its first year, there was a $100 million business. And then it declined over time. Declined so much that it, they sold it to this private equity firm I was working with. And this is how, this is how Dry L worked. They gave you a steam what they call a steam bag. You'd put up to four articles of clothing in this steam bag. And then you get a wet cloth at that top middle picture that had a cleaning solution in it. You'd put the cleaning cloth in the bag with your clothes. You would zip it up, put it in a dryer and let it tumble dry for 30 minutes. That's how the process worked. You put, you put your clothes, your dry clean only clothes in the bag, cleanser, and then you tumble dried it uh, on normal for 30 minutes. And that killed a lot of bacteria, right? And this is a, and just so you know, with, with the research, this dry L being able to dry clean your, your clothes at home, consumers love the concept. They absolutely love it. But there was an issue with execution. Even though consumers liked the, the concept, there was a disconnect from reality, right? When you took your clothes to the dry cleaner, they didn't only clean your clothes, they um, ironed your clothes, they pressed them, they, they hung them up for you, put them in a plastic bag. It was just a different experience. So we had an issue. Given that we had an issue, the team and I, we, we got on a plane, we went back to Cincinnati and we went to P&G headquarters. We talked to the R&D director that launched this, this business. Her name is Carol Burning. And um, we said, what's going on, Carol? And, and I'm, I'm gonna wrap up soon, I'm watching the time. What Carol said was, yeah, this, this product is interesting. A lot of people aren't repeating, but there are some people that do repeat. Those people are folks that use them for jeans, because there was this group of folks that had $200 jeans that they did not want to fade and folks that used it for sweaters, right? Interesting. Another thing that they noticed is, and this is consumer feedback I saw, in addition to cleaning your clothes, we had a, a nice floral fragrance that we put on top of the clothing. Consumers thought that we were just covering up the, the odor with fragrance. That made them skeptical. So I'm going to quickly go over how we applied product placebo to this. And then I think we have some questions and, I, and I'll go to answering these questions. The first thing we did, remember I talked about that floral scent? We used the Listerine burn on, on dry L. What's the Listerine burn? That floral scent caused skepticism. So instead of having that strong scent, we drove it down a little bit and we, um, added a, what we call an alcohol top note. So instead of just being floral, it smelled clinical almost, it, a cue for, for being clean. That was the first placebo we, act, we added. The second placebo we added was Betty Crocker. If you guys don't know the, the story in Betty Crocker, Betty Crocker in, 19, in the night, late 1960s or 1970, Betty Crocker launched with a just add water cake. And it was one of those things back when we had stronger, you know, we, we played stronger roles, but mothers, all they had to do was take 
take the cake mix, put water in it, stick it in the oven, and it came out perfect. What happened was they started sharing it with their family, and the family would lavish praise on them. You know, Mommy, you are a wonderful cook. She started feeling guilty about it, so she stopped buying it. They made it, they looked into it, and they made a tweak. Instead of just adding water, they added an, an egg or two, and sales went up. Evidently, doing that extra work, that a little bit messiness of doing the egg and putting it in the mix, made it just complicated enough that they did not feel guilty about being complimented on their cooking ability because they did more than just add water. And the last one I'll share with you, we looked at doing a Tide placebo. What's the Tide placebo? When you wash your clothes in the washing machine, you open the washing machine, you see bubbles, you know, you see a lot of things going on. And it turns out in the R&D and P&G, they figured out that, you know what, those bubbles, they're just an inefficient side effect. You don't need those bubbles. We can be more efficient and just take the bubbles out. So that's what they did. Well, after they, you know, put that new batch in the market, guess what happened? Customer service lights started lighting up. People were calling Procter & Gamble or Tide and saying, hey, my Tide is not working. It's not cleaning my clothes. It was cleaning their clothes. They didn't see evidence. The thing that we wanted to do on uh, dry L that would use this placebo is we wanted people to see the dirt. And we, we looked at a couple things to make that happen. Um, but we got to the point on that where I, I felt like we might be pushing the boundaries of, eth of ethics. So we let that go. But I just share that with you to let you know how you approach the problem. I know I'm short at time. I'll, I'll stop now and I will um, answer any questions that we have. So. All right, I'm sorry. All right, the first. Excellent. I can read a few off if you'd like. Yeah, if you can read them to me, that would be great. That's great. Um, can, can you talk a little bit about the consumer research you did to utilize um, and understand the placebo effect? Oh, because that's, that's a great question. And, and I'll talk about it with this dry aisle example. Here's the con consumer research. We would, um, consumer research oftentimes was based on what the consumer thought. We would let people try dry ale and they would just give us feedback on what, on what they thought the performance was. After we added those two placebos, and, and I, I said it pre pretty quickly, the Duncan Hines effect that we did on, on uh, dry ale, I was going fast because of time. We added a spray bottle that had a solution from the, the cloth so people can control exactly where they put their solution, whether it was on armpits. We sent the stuff out and our consumers gave us significantly higher marks in customer satisfaction. They really felt like it cleaned much better, even though all we did was take down the floral scent, increase the alcohol scent, and gave them a little bit more flexibility to put the solution where they wanted. That the, so the research that we, we use was customer feedback, consumer feedback. That's excellent. Thank you so much. I know there are a lot of um, thanks and fascinating insights chatter going on in the comments section, but I really appreciate it, Aaron. I know um, I'm rethinking my mouthwash choices now, so um, I'm sure others are too. Um, but our next Sheller Lunchtime Live session is Friday, September 24th at 12 p.m. The topic is Serving on a Nonprofit Board, What You Need to Know, featuring Dory Pop, Managing Director of the Institute Institute for Leadership and Social Impact at Scheller. Dory will share her experience serving on various nonprofit boards. She'll go over the basics of boards and board service, including requirements, responsibilities, types of boards, how to get started, and more. Um, you can register for this event and learn more about future Scheller Lunchtime Live sessions by following the Georgia Tech Scheller College of Business on LinkedIn. A recording of this session and future sessions will be available on LinkedIn and YouTube pages as well. Thank you all for joining us, and thank you again, Erin. Thank you.